In earlier videos, we identified all the steps our industry performs to satisfy the desires of prospective graduate students. It looks messy, doesn't it? And the reason why it's so messy is that reality is messy. But instead of trying to simplify and dumb down this reality, we're going to accept the messiness and focus on increasing our awareness of what's going on and where our options for action are. Part 4 of Strategy Sessions Made Simple will show you how to start doing that as we turn this mess into a map. Why a map? Well, that's because when you need to discover new ways for moving forward, a map is just about the best tool you can have because maps show you the position of components, rivers, towns and hills relative to a fixed anchor point, in this case, north on a compass. This helps us to orientate ourselves. We know that if we are at position A and want to get to position B, we need to head north and we will need to cross or go round this river marked here on the map. The equivalent of north on a business map are the user's needs. This point is crucial. No user needs, no map. On the map of our business schools, we see we have components. These are the things that need to be done to satisfy our user needs. And we can see the position of these components relative to our fixed anchor. The components higher up the value chain are more visible to these users and are therefore things they are more likely to care about. For example, graduate students would care far more about the offer of a money-back guarantee than the financial modelling required to make this happen. And they're going to be far more interested in the opportunities for real-life practice our business courses offer than the incentives we had to offer businesses to provide these. Of course, the incentives and the modelling are how we create value, but our users don't care about these as they can't see them, and we should be aware of that. However, we have a problem here. This map doesn't provide us with options for movement. We have no idea where we should focus. And that's because this is not a map yet. To turn this into a real map we can use to help us find new paths forward, we're going to need to add in some concept of movement. And this is the key part of the Wardley mapping method, the evolutionary axis. It describes the four stages through which all components evolve. In the first stage, there is complete uncertainty about components. We may have the genesis of a new invention, a novel practice, or a brand new concept. Or we may not. We don't know yet. We are in uncharted territory. In this stage, there is no demand for this new component, and probably not much certainty about what it could be used for. However, if our new invention or idea does find some demand, it will evolve. Moving to the right, into the second stage. This is where we might start custom building the product for early adopters or find that our new practice is simultaneously emerging in other places as well. Stage two is where the new starts to grow in popularity, but it's still in its early stage of life. So there's still much uncertainty about it and therefore it may not survive. This is the first crucial point. Will the new thing, a technology, idea, product or practice be adopted by the mainstream? Will it cross the chasm depicted in Moore's model of diffusion? Many good ideas or inventions don't. However, there are some important differences between Moore's model of diffusion and a Wardley map. Firstly, Moore's model was based on the adoption of a new idea or technology by a certain percentage of the market. And this is problematical. For example, how would you answer if you were asked whether gold bars were a commodity or not? In other words, would you only consider price and availability when buying a gold bar? Or could we convince you to pay more for it if it came from a certain brand? Your answer is probably no, as most people would agree that gold bars are an industrialized, standardized commodity, even though less than 1% of people own them. But if we asked you whether mobile phones were a commodity, you might reply that they're a product, as they can still be differentiated in all sorts of ways, by brand, by new features, or new designs. Yet in some places of the world, the mobile phone penetration in the market is higher than 100%, with people having more than one phone each. So even though mobile phones are widely owned or adopted, 
most people still consider them a product and expect them to change and evolve further. This suggests that adoption by the market is not an accurate measure of how evolved something is and whether it will change further. And this is why the x-axis on a Wardley map uses certainty rather than adoption to measure how evolved something is. For the greater the certainty users have about what a component is used for, the greater the demand for it will be. And the greater the certainty suppliers have about how to make this component, the more supply there will be. And together, supply and demand is the economic force driving the evolution of everything we do and how we do it. Moving components from the left of the map, where they're uncharted and full of uncertainty, to the right of the map, where they've become industrialized as there's widespread certainty about them. There are four stages of evolution. The first two we've already covered. So now let's look at the third one, the product stage, where there is sufficient certainty about the supply and demand for this component and organizations can make money from it. However, this is also the stage of increased competition as, where there is demand, more suppliers will rise up and try to meet it. This is also the stage where Moore's adoption curve ends, with the laggards finally buying these components. But Wardley's evolution axis has one more critical stage, the stage of commodities, utilities, and best practices. And this is an incredibly important and potentially even more profitable stage if your organization can get its strategy right, even though Moore's model and most businesses completely ignore it. When there's widespread certainty about what a component is and what it's for, it has the potential to become a platform on which the future can be built. Think about electricity, which, in its genesis stage, was once a thing of wonder, but it is now the platform on which almost all value chains are built. We know this because if there's a problem with this component, such as it being switched off, it will cause widespread disruption. Therefore, the shift of a component from the product to the utility stage is an important moment and much can be made of this when using maps for identifying strategic moves. But that's getting ahead of ourselves. First, we must turn our value chain into a map by allocating every component into the stage of evolution for our industry. To help us do that, Wardley provided a cheat sheet based on his research on over 9,000 publications describing these stages. All you need to do is discuss with your mapping group which column of descriptions best describes each component, which gives us a map of the landscape for the industry of business schools in our country. When we do this, we will find that some of the components we identified earlier seem less important now, especially as what we're trying to do is get a helicopter view of things so we can leave them off our map. And to keep the map manageable, we follow our own advice on focusing on a maximum of two to three needs. So we move the students' need for choice about studying online or offline to a separate map we've done with the university. What we do now is to show our map to other people who we think could have valuable input. And we let them challenge our assumptions as that way we keep improving their map and our awareness of the landscape. What we can see at this stage is that the majority of components are in the product or good practice stage, which suggests that this is a profitable industry, but also a competitive one. There are also some components in the custom built or emerging practice stage that could be sources of future competitive advantage if we get them right. There are several components in the commoditized stage, indicating that these are costs of doing business in the industry and are not something we can differentiate our offering on but there are several components that are in the transition stage between product and commodity. And as we said, these could be areas of great opportunity. And we'll explore that in the next video. For now, though, we have created a map of our industry and we can use this to start discovering new ways forward for our business school and discussing why we should make these moves and not others. And this is what we'll explore in the next installment of Strategy Sessions Made Simple. So watch out for that.